Born under the name Herman Webster Mudgett, Dr. Henry Howard Holmes was a man of many aliases, many lies, countless deceptions, and a trail of bodies wherever he traveled. Holmes is one of the first documented captured serial killers in the United States. He admitted to a total of 27 murders, though only nine were confirmed, and given the tools he had at his disposal, the body count was likely much higher, with the higher estimates ranging as much as over 200. Although he was considered to be a relatively pleasant child, the circumstances of his upbringing were less than ideal. He was born in 1861, the third son of Levy Horton Mudgett, a violent alcoholic. Holmes had an exceptional intellectual aptitude at a very young age, and excelled at school, though this brought with it unwanted attention in the form of bullying from his fellow classmates. This culminated in one major event that would shape the rest of Holmes' life for the worse. A group of jealous fellow students decided to play a prank on Holmes by locking him in a doctor's office that contained a human skeleton. The encounter frightened him at first, but he soon developed a morbid fascination. He later recalled that the experience cured him of the fear of death. After that, death became an obsession, and he began regularly dissecting animals he found or captured in the wild. After graduating high school at the age of 16, Holmes spent two years as a teacher and then enrolled in university. While at the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery, he stole cadavers, disfigured the corpses, and claimed they were killed accidentally in order to collect on insurance policies he had previously taken out on the deceased. Holmes' early life was filled with insurance fraud, minor swindles, and the occasional missing woman or child. Holmes was fond of befriending employees and strangers alike, taking out insurance policies on them, naming himself as the benefactor, and then killing those people to collect on the policy. Holmes married a total of three women in his life, and while he did attempt to divorce his first wife after acquiring a second, the paperwork was never finalized. His wives never suspected him of any wrongdoing. While he had killed his mistresses and any children he had had with them, all three of his wives survived him. Holmes abandoned his first two wives, exclaiming he had grown bored of them, and in both cases left them behind to travel to a distant location. Holmes' truly dastardly deeds did not take place until he moved to Chicago in 1886. There he began his plans to create what would later be referred to as his murder castle. After moving to Chicago, Holmes took a job at Elizabeth S. Holton's drugstore, rather easily with his medical background. After the mysterious death of Elizabeth's husband, Holmes offered to purchase the drugstore from her using money he had saved from his previous schemes. The deal was finalized, and Holmes immediately took out a mortgage on the drugstore to fund the purchase of a large block of land on the empty lot across the street. At this time, Holmes continued to commit insurance fraud and also sold water that he claimed had special curative properties out of the drugstore. In essence, snake oil. Elizabeth also mysteriously disappeared shortly thereafter. Holmes would tell people who asked about her that she moved to California to be closer to relatives. With all his ducks in a row, Holmes began working on his infamous murder castle. To the outside world, it appeared to be a shopping center and hotel, but the second and third floors contained many secrets, passageways and death traps. To create his monstrous manor, Holmes hired a number of contractors at various points in the construction. Every company he contracted was only signed on to construct a small portion of the building, so that no one person saw too much of the building's inner workings. One person, however, was involved with the construction from start to finish. That man was Benjamin Peetzel, a carpenter with a shady past and a criminal record. Police would later describe Peetzel as a vile monster with a black heart and Holmes's stooge. Peetzel would help Holmes install many of the traps within the building. The first floor of the hotel contained mostly shops. The second and third floors had rooms for nightly rent, 
as well as several offices. Those floors also contain trap doors, chutes, and secret passages that would lead to a hidden portion of the building that only Holmes and Petzl knew about. The rooms were designed to be soundproof, so it was completely possible for a guest to be staying in a room, while on the other side of the wall someone was slowly starving, suffocating, or dehydrating to death. The secret portion of the manor also contained a laboratory where Holmes would dismember bodies, an airtight bank vault where Holmes would leave people to suffocate, and a room for hanging people. In addition, there was an iron-plated room with multiple blowtorches mounted into the walls for burning victims alive. Holmes also claimed to be a fan of glass shaping, so he had a furnace installed under the false pretense that it would be used for glass blowing. Unfortunately, it is quite likely that Holmes never shaped a piece of glass in his life, the furnace was probably used to discard any evidence of murder. The secret side of the building also had a prison with multiple cells. It is believed Holmes kept some of his victims locked in those cells for months at a time, keeping them alive while torturing them and breaking their will. The cells were rigged so that any time a prisoner tried to escape, a buzzer would go off in Holmes' office. The basement also had an acid pit, as well as a trap door that led into the alleyway so that Holmes could leave or enter his property without anyone ever knowing. Holmes completed his death castle in 1892 and named it the World's Fair Hotel. It was operational well in time for the 1983 World's Fair that was held in Chicago, so Holmes had a high volume of travelers as potential victims who would not have family around to immediately report them missing. Holmes also placed several ads in the papers, looking specifically for female workers. When one would arrive, Holmes would instruct them to take out all of their money in savings, claiming they would need it for startup costs. Holmes would then lure these women to his hidden rooms and torture them for information about where they kept their valuables at home before killing them. In similar fashion, Holmes also placed ads in the personal section of the paper claiming he was looking for a wife. Those women met the same fate as the prospective employees. While Holmes did sometimes burn the evidence of his killing, he was also in the practice of meticulously stripping the flesh off bodies down to the bone in his lab. The remaining skeletons were then sold to medical schools. This practice, as well as Holmes' other regular schemes, were what allowed him to regularly pay off the mortgage on the property on which the castle stood. It was during this period in Holmes's life when he met a woman by the name of Minnie Williams. She was a wealthy railroad heiress. H.H. H. Holmes must have had an incredible ability to charm women, because Minnie and Holmes quickly entered a relationship, even though Holmes already had two wives that Minnie probably never knew about. Holmes quickly convinced Minnie to hand over a property deed she owned to some land in Fort Worth, Texas, most likely under the pretense that he wanted a second location to open another one of his hotels. Minnie complied, and it wasn't much longer before Minnie disappeared. It was in the spring of 1894 that the situation finally started turning sour for Holmes. The World's Fair had ended, and the national economy was in a general slump. Holmes could no longer afford to pay his creditors. While the police never suspected Holmes or the World's Fair Hotel of any wrongdoing, they were generally concerned about the 50-some missing persons count at the end of the World's Fair. In light of all the unfavorable circumstances, Holmes abandoned his castle and took up residence in Fort Worth, Texas, on the property he acquired from Minnie Williams. His goal was to build a second murder castle, but he was never able to acquire enough funds. He was arrested during a botched horse theft in July of 1894, but made bail so he wasn't detained for long. Once free, he also failed to successfully collect insurance money on his own faked death. Holmes did successfully collect insurance money on the death of his former partner in crime, the notorious carpenter Benjamin Peetzel. Originally, the two planned to fake Peetzel's death, but in the end, Holmes carried out the deed, 
lighting Pizzal on fire with the flammable chemical benzene. Holmes had situated himself in town, playing the role of a scientist, and claimed Pizzal's death was a lab accident. Holmes then proceeded to start an affair with Pizzal's wife, and even took custody over three of Pizzal's children. This was all during the time that Holmes was married to his third wife. Holmes then proceeded to escort both his wife, as well as Pizzal's and the children, to the Canadian border, although he sent them separately to avoid being found out as an adulterer. After nearing the Canadian border, Holmes killed Pizzal's wife and the three children by stuffing them in a box with a hole in it and suffocating them by pumping gas in through a hose. But this time, Holmes' dirty deeds finally caught up to him. One of Holmes' insurance fraud accomplices, Marion Hedgepeth, tipped off the police since Holmes never made good on his promise to pay Hedgepeth a portion of his insurance fraud profits. The police and private investigators soon started digging into the life of Holmes and began the long process of revealing Holmes' many crimes under an extensive list of fake names. It wasn't long before police began investigating the murder castle. Holmes' hidden half of the castle was revealed after police spoke with former property caretaker Patrick Quinlan, who claimed he was never allowed to clean on the second and third floors. Police found this suspicious and began a careful search of the property, revealing all the horrors that took place there. As a side note, Quinlan committed suicide many years later, leaving a note saying he could no longer sleep at night. Although he had no knowledge or involvement in Holmes' activities, he still felt guilty by association. According to Quinlan's family, the discovery at the World's Fair Hotel haunted him for the rest of his life and even drove him to the point of experiencing hallucinations. Holmes was finally tracked down to Boston in November of 1894 and taken into custody by the famous Pinkerton's Investigation Agency. Ironically, it was the outstanding warrant from the botched horse theft that allowed authorities to make the arrest. At the time, Holmes appeared poised to leave the country by boat with his third wife in tow. Prior to his execution, Holmes sat in jail for well over a year, while investigators struggled to put together the many pieces of Holmes' various crimes throughout the years. While in jail, Holmes' story kept changing, as did the number of murders to which he admitted guilt. Initially, Holmes maintained his innocence, though his admission of guilt and claimed body count changed many times over the course of his stay in jail. Towards the end of his jail time, Holmes' thoughts on himself took a wild turn, as he was constantly comparing himself to Satan, even noting that his emaciated facial appearance had taken a gruesome and satanic cast. He was also quoted as saying, I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer. No more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world, and he has been with me ever since. Holmes was hung on May 7, 1896, though he was only ever officially convicted for the murder of Benjamin Pietzel. Holmes remained calm and stoic right up until his death. When the noose was tied and the lever pulled, Holmes' neck didn't snap. It would seem there was some degree of karmic justice in his death. He struggled, twitched, and slowly suffocated over the course of 15 minutes, and was declared dead after 20. <laughs>